point, this point of turning in the letter. If we go back to James chapter 2, we'll remember that James talked a lot about wrongful action, uh, about doing the wrong thing, about being hypocritical in how we behave. He went so far as to say that faith without works is dead. It says that you would do well if you fulfill the royal law, the law that says love your neighbor as yourself. But if you show prejudice, you have committed a sin. And so our hypocritical actions, our prejudicial actions, our thoughtless actions to ignore the needs of others and give empty blessings, all of these wrongful actions have to come to mind when we talk about the therefore moving to repentance. The second thing that I remember is in chapter 3, James moves from wrongful action to wrongful speech. Focusing on the influential speak of a speech of a teacher, but more generally to the way that all believers in Jesus Christ speak one to another. He says this, uh, see how small a flame can set ablaze a mighty forest, and the tongue is a fire, a world of wickedness set among the parts of the body with the power to corrupt the entire body. It sets the whole course of human existence on fire and itself is set on fire by hell. So we're reminded of also the wrongful speech. But not only wrongful speech, but as we move to the end of James chapter 3, that wrongful speech moves to wrongful thinking. And there James compares the wisdom of the world with godly wisdom. See, the problem with the wisdom of the world is the motivation behind it. It's based on competitive envy, on disputes and conflict of trying to get ahead of others to covet what others have and to try to seek it out for the self. In fact, the other part of worldly wisdom is not just the envious longings and competitive nature, it's also the ego-centered ambition. James has a great little proverb that he includes here, and it's good just for our own memories. He says, wherever ambition and envy exist, disorder and every evil practice will persist. So when we come to the therefore, we know that James has already revealed in our lives wrongful action, wrongful speech, and wrongful thinking. And so keep that in your, your backdrop as we look at three demands that James has for repentance. The first demand is simple. Ditch the devil. I hope you can remember that. This is really good news because um, what James recognizes here is that um, even though we are sinners, um, we are victims of sin. That there's actually an adversary, there's actually some other force, there's something outside of ourselves that pulls us towards what's wrong. There's there's a, a devil that works in our life to highlight desire and lust and passion and to move us towards temptation that we might fall. It's not just a, a blank slate, a random world out there, but there's actually something evil that is against us. So this is what I love about what James says here in Ditching the Devil. He says this, resist the devil and he will flee from you. It's a command with a promise. 
I always like it when the Bible promises me something. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. It reminds me of a story that Captain Craig is sharing with the children online today. A story of Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew when he goes out into the wilderness and fasts for 40 days and 40 nights. Now, at the end of that period of fasting, the Bible simply says Jesus was hungry. <laughs> to which I'm like, of course. So it was when Jesus was at his weakest that the adversary came. And he said, speaking to his ego, which is something that, that the enemy often does if you really are the son of God turn these stones into bread and Jesus says man does not live on bread alone but on every word that comes from the mouth of God but the devil's not done and he takes Jesus to Jerusalem to the holy city puts him on top of the highest point of the temple and says throw yourself off It is written in the Bible that he commands his angels concerning you and by their hands they will lift you up so not even your foot will strike a stone. But Jesus replies quickly. It also says, do not put the Lord your God to the test. And so the devil takes him to a very high mountain and shows him all the kingdoms of the world in all their glory and splendor and says, if you bow down before me. Everything that you see will be yours. And Jesus replies, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And in that moment, Jesus said, get away from me, Satan. And just as James tells us, Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. The devil runs away, beaten, and God's angels come and minister to the needs of Jesus. So Jesus sets that example for us to resist the devil, and he will flee from you. You will have victory over them. The, the promise here is that the evil one will not prevail over you. He will not win the victory. In the end, the promise here is that the victory is yours. <laughs> and that's an amazing thing. But we're a little different from Jesus, at least I am. And that I didn't start out perfect. I started out in a different place. I, I'm a, a corrupt person from a corrupt generation. I'm from a sinful people and I have sin and so I don't really have a high horse to stand on when I come to the beginning of this battle. I'm not battling as the son of God who is sinless in every way. I battle the evil one from a place of someone who has already been defeated and isn't that a little bit different? And so this is the reason that I think James also throws out another piece of advice, another command. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. So that's me, double-minded sinner. When James is talking about cleansing the hands, washing your hands of this, what he's talking about is sinful action, right? What we do um, in James' own day, in his the churches that he's talking to, one of the big issues that comes up again and again in this book is the exploitation of the poor, the disadvantaged, those who are down and out, so what's happened is that there's a class of people who are rich and powerful and everybody else aren't doing so well. And those who have power, those who have wealth set the conditions for the workplace. They set the prices for the wage. They set the prices for rent. They set the interest rate for the loans. And so James will go so far as to say, you are committing murder. He holds 
the rich responsible for the exploitation of the poor. He holds the powerful responsible for the lowered state of life, even death itself. So, violent hands is something that we have to address. Do our act, how do our actions impact others? This is very critical for James. That's why he says, if you fulfill the royal law, love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. But if you show prejudice, if you take advantage of the disadvantage, if you exploit, you commit a sin. So one of the things we have to do in washing our hands is to turn away from the things that we know are evil. If we do what we know is evil, then to us it is indeed sin. Now, here's the problem with all that, is that when we talk about our hearts, it seems that we're able to justify most of our actions. Most people who are caught in a sin, when I talk to them, they have good reasons why they have to do it that way. They talk about how it's a compromise, it's not ideal, it's just kind of where they are. And what I hear in that worldview is self-justification. We put ourselves uh, as the judge over our own actions instead of looking at our lives in the worldview of the Almighty. We have hearts that have been made impure. So what happens in James' day is that one of the big issues was idolatry. You have a Jewish people who are part of a Roman Empire. And so there are pressure, pressures in the Roman Empire to conform to the standards of idol worship. Now, those who were um, from the other nations, the Gentiles, who were God-fearers and began to follow the way, they were already connected to a sense of idolatry. So what happens is there's a struggle. The, the, the idea of having several gods or other sources of power is that you're trained in your own worldview to appease you know, the god of war so that you don't have violence against you, to appease the god of love so that you have a good love life, to appease this god and that god. And so what you're doing is that you fear and love and maybe more fear these other gods, and so you just want to appease them so that... Um, you can cover all your bases. But for the Jewish mind, for the Judeo-Christian mindset that is not polytheistic, we believe in one God. There is only one. But still there are pressures to participate because in this mix of idol worship, all of the temples were the places that had the big ballrooms where weddings took place, where birthday parties took place, where achievement celebrations took place. So if you were going to go to your nephew's graduation party, it could happen in a pagan temple. And so there's a lot of pressure on people, even who don't believe in other gods, to compromise, to participate in the eating of meat offered to idols, the drinking of blood, the eating of strangled meat, right? It's not that they want to worship those false gods. It's that they want to be accepted by the community. They want to have good social networks and they want to advance their status and that's not so different from us. Most of us are not tempted to go bow down before a gold statue. But if you look into the heart, you might see that you've made certain compromises to appease social or peer pressure. You might made compromises to get ahead in the workplace. You maybe have said, you know, this is not what I really b believe, but I will I, this is not what I think is right, but I will make a compromise in my own life. And so you sin, but the real issue is whatever causes you to compromise, the thing that you desire most to be accepted, to be a part of a network, to be a part of a club, to advance 
in your professional career, wherever it forces a compromise in your Christian life, that is your idol. Not the, the act that you do, but the reason that you do it. See, the way that you can know that you have an idol in your heart is you look into your heart and you see that the beginnings of an idol is when you have this, this jealous, this envious longing for something that is not yours, that is not godly. And that desire you convince yourself over time is your right to have. I have such and such freedom. I have such and such right. And then it moves from a place of desire to a place of demand. I need this thing. I deserve this thing. It is right for me to have it. It's life owes me this. Then you know that you're deep in the, the sin of idolatry when that moves to the place when people deny you what you think you demand or deserve. You judge them because they haven't been fair to you. And then when it takes full effect, you begin to punish them. This is one of the things that we work out in marriage classes sometimes. A husband will be punishing a wife or a wife punishing a husband. And if we go back, it's because there's some desire that has become a demand, that has become an idol in their life, and they're punishing because they don't think they're getting what they deserve. Sometimes you don't even know who to be mad at. I notice this most with like my kids as they're growing up. There's a, a phrase that my wife and I use. Man, he's just mad at the world. He didn't get what he wanted. He doesn't know who to punish. So just mad at the world. The dog can have a bad day when a kid is just mad at the world. So, we ask the Lord to examine our hearts. Purifying our heart means to look inward and see what those desires. What is the thing that holds, that, that you go after more than you go after God? What do you fear more than you fear God? What do you love more than you love God? If you pursue fear or love something more than you love God, that's idolatry. And that's the reason that if you go back to the beginning of chapter 4, you can look at it in your Bibles right now if you still have them open. James begins this passage by saying, you adulterers. And he's not talking about sexual immorality here. He's saying, you cheats. You love the world more than you love the Lord. By verse 4 he says don't you know that the one who befriends the world has set himself against God so we ditch the devil and those devilish schemes and then I'll give you the, the second demand of repentance for James and that is that we drop the ego it is so easy to serve the self, to, to talk about the self, to promote the self, to work for the benefit of our selves. This is so important that James says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So in grace, what we want to do is in the same way we have clean hands and pure hearts, we want to move to a place that we have a renewed mind. Paul puts it a little bit differently. He says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. In other words, think differently than the corrupt generation, than your age, your position, your culture. Think differently when he talks to Philippians Paul says it this way your attitude your worldview should be the same as that of Jesus Christ who in his very nature 
is God. He did not consider equality with God something he had to hang on to. But instead, he made himself nothing. He was made in human likeness and took on the form of a servant. If we come from a place of sin, I think one of the components of humbling ourselves is to recognize that we are indeed sinners. This passage is not one that maybe you want to write up on a, a board or crochet and put over your kitchen door. The, 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 the word lament or grieve Grieve, mourn, weep. Those are commands that we're, we're just not used to hearing. We want to be, be happy, right? We'd rather have up there, be happy, don't worry. But instead, James says, grieve, mourn, weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy into gloom. So at the beginning of James' book, he says, consider it joy when you encounter all kinds of trials that joy is connected to endurance to growing into spiritual maturity but if we look at our lives and we see the sin we shouldn't just laugh about it it's not joyous it's not festive to be sinful in that case we have to say no our laughter should be turned to mourning our joy to gloom I am reminded of David in when he's confronted with his sin in Psalms. He says, restore unto me a clean heart and place into me a right spirit. Don't take away from me the joy of my salvation. These are the words of someone who realizes that the only promise for a sinner apart from grace, is judgment. So, we ditch the devil. We drop the ego. And the third demand is this, that we draw near to God. This is also a command with a promise. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. I love when the Jewish mind uses the term draw near because it takes me back to the Hebrew word karab. And that is a word that is dear to my heart because it was taken from Hebrew and um, Arabic into the Swahili language that I spoke. So it's the word in Swahili is karibu. And I get to watch what karibu means. It means to be welcome. You're welcome into the home. That's the plaque that they put on the doors there. Karibu means enter, please. It's a word that talks about table fellowship. Karibu, come eat with me and I with you. In fact, outside of Swahili speaking people, people who don't know what the word karibu means, they still have incorporated it into their language for the particular setting of welcoming someone with hospitality to share a meal with. So in Malawi, when I'm walking by a group of people who are eating their lunch outside and they see that I have nothing to eat, someone will say, Karibu, draw near, eat with us, share table fellowship with us. The reason that I like the way that that plays out in my mind is because it reminds me also of the Lord's Supper. That the Lord, in his gracious mercy, says, Karibu, come dine with me. But he's not just sharing a meal like other friends have done for me many times. The meal comes at a much greater cost. How great the grace of God that what he offers us is, is his own broken body. What he offers us is his own shed blood. When I think of the word, Karibu, or draw near. I think of how Jesus speaks to the church in Revelation. He says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him. 
and eat with him and him with me. What a great promise of scripture. Draw near to God and he will indeed draw near to you. He's already paid the price in full. The table is set and he's saying, Karibu, come. Come, my child. There's a place at the table for you. And so, as we respond to James' message today, I think we should look in at ourselves. Is there an area of repentance where I must ditch the devil? Is there something where I'm just not, I'm not thinking about things right, I'm not feeling things right? Do I need a purified heart? Do I need clean hands? Can you uh, restore a right spirit in me, God, uh, and drop the ego? And then finally, has your relationship with the Lord gone dull? Has it become a religion? Has it become ethics and morality to you? Are you just following a pattern of life? Or are you ready to go deep with the one who knows you the best and loves you the most? How will you respond when our Lord says, Karibu, come near. Draw near to me and I will draw near to you. Be blessed. Come thou fount of every blessing Tune my heart to sing thy grace Streams of mercy never ceasing Call for songs of loudest praise Teach me some melodious song Sung by flaming tongues above Praise the mount I fixed upon it Mount of thy redeeming love Here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I'm come, and I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus saw me when a stranger wandering from the fold of God. Me to rescue me from danger, interposed his precious blood. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor daily I constrained to be let thy goodness like a fetter bind my wandering heart to thee prone to wander Lord I feel it prone to leave the God I love heal to my heart Lord Take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Amen. 
Guys, can we pray? Father, we thank you so much for this time we have of just loving each other in, in the social distance way that we are doing. But Father, we, we thank you for allowing us to come and worship. Father, we ask though that, that these idols that we have buried in our heart, Lord, that you take it and you go and, and, and show them to us, Lord. Father, that, that these things are not hidden in the dark but rather that you bring them to light so that way we can be closer to you. Father, that's, that's our prayer. That we want to be closer and closer to you. So Father, I thank you for the gospel. I thank you, I thank you for its implications in our lives today. As you keep, keep renewing us, Lord, as you keep on, on bringing us closer to you, Father, thank you. Lord, we, we give you honor and we give you praise because you are worth that and so much more. So Father, in your name I pray. Amen. Guys, be blessed. Let's see you next week. <laughs>